Welcome to Dental Business Rx. Practice success in 30 minutes or less. Thank you for calling ABC Dental. Has your practice stopped growing? Or as some might say, hit a plateau or a ceiling? Is this a recent development or is this something that's been going on for some time, maybe a couple of years? Well, the first thing to know is if this is happening to you, it's not all that uncommon. As a matter of fact, if I were to do a, an unscientific survey of dentists who, contact, who have contacted our company over the years, I would say stop growing is the number two reason we get called here at MGE behind things contracting or not going well. So it's a pretty common situation. And if your practice has stopped growing and you're concerned about it, it, it tells you a couple of things. One, your practice was growing at one point. Otherwise, how would you notice that it stopped? And two, you obviously realize or know innately that lack of growth is not a good thing. Inflation alone explains this point. If your P&L for 2023 and the profit of the bottom line on the P&L was the exact same as 2022, you're effectively losing ground as the purchasing power of your dollar and the costs associated with running your business are continuously going up. So if you find yourself in this situation, what's the solution? Well, that's what I want to talk about in this week's episode. Specifically, I want to explain what's normally behind this lack of growth phenomena, as well as giving you a simple solution that could get your practice growing again. My name is Jeff Bloomberg, and I'm your host. And I say we just start off by jumping into this and explaining the phenomena. I'm going to start by labeling it, giving it a name. This lack of growth leveled out condition is something that we here call a paused statistic. You know, sort of like pressing pause on, well, you don't really have DVD players or VCRs anymore, pressing pause on something on the video player, right? It's a paused statistic. And this paused statistic is actually a personnel issue. And to explain what it is, and how to fix it, I'm going to take some information that we use on the MGE program from the Hubbard Management System. If you're familiar with MGE, you know that we use the Hubbard Management System developed by L. Ron Hubbard. And Mr. Hubbard's works on the subject of management are expansive, literally millions of words and cover just about any aspect of management and organization you could possibly conceive of from HR to financial planning, increasing efficiency, strategic planning, statistics. I mean, I could go on. It's expansive. So for this week's episode, to explain this concept of pause statistics, I'm just lifting something directly out of one of our seminars on statistic management where Mr. Hubbard explains. So first off, what is a pause statistic? Here's what Mr. Hubbard says. During expansion, one has areas where statistics become level. Here, statistics pause because lines jam. People get overworked and confused. The traffic is just too heavy. So you've expanded, you've expanded, you've expanded, you've grown. Things have gotten busier and busier and busier. Then things start to jam up. People get overworked, as Mr. Hubbard says, and confused. The traffic is getting too heavy on these lines, okay? Maybe your schedule is packed. You're scheduled out eight weeks in advance, but you want to increase your production growth, but you can't. You feel that you've maxed out. Or you have an office manager and your office manager was pretty on top of things and was instrumental in making the practice grow, but the place is getting busier and busier and busier. Now the office manager is spending half their day being the treatment coordinator. They don't have time for a lot of the things that they used to do, making sure that scheduling was being done correctly or even hiring. Maybe you've, you've lost some personnel and they don't have as much time to dedicate to hiring anymore or marketing and promotion. All right, they're maybe starting to fall behind a little bit because they're they're buried in an office with a patient for four to six hours a day doing treatment presentations. You could also have this in hygiene. Maybe you, your practice is growing, hygiene is packing up more and more and more, and you've now got you've just added your fourth hygienist and you have two doctors. So we have six providers essentially, four hygienists, two doctors. And maybe this scheduler was doing a great job when there was two hygienists and one doctor or one and a half doctor and three hygienists. And then you started to notice as the place was growing, yeah, it's growing, growing, growing. You've added that third hygienist. Maybe you very mildly noticed there were more openings than there were in the past, right? But the overall productivity was up, so it didn't bother you 
all that much. Then you've added that fourth hygienist and now the associate has come on full time. Now you start to notice some real problems. And maybe you notice the scheduler is putting a little bit of overtime or you're you're not able to fill openings as quickly as you used to. The, the common denominator, again, the areas were growing, the practice was expanding, or that area of the practice was expanding. Now it's hit a bit of a ceiling and sort of is stagnating and going along. Okay, so what is the handling for this you know, pause statistic? Well, it assumes a few conditions are in place. So I'm going to read you what Mr. Hubbard says, and then we'll give you a few examples of its application. So here's what he says. And where do you really repair in such a case? More clerks? No. Always look to the lines of the highest position in the overloaded area and get them eased. In expansion, the person who never notices is the man in charge, and his lines are the most crippling to the organization if jammed. So again, if I had um, a practice, you know, obviously I'm looking at the doctors and the office manager's lines first because they're the highest level positions in the practice. But then again, this assumes that you have some form of organization and some form of hierarchy. That's one of the basic assumptions that we're looking at here. So I have people, number one, I have division of labor. I don't just have three people at the front desk called front desk people that all do a little bit of everything because then I have nobody responsible for really anything. Um, that's going to be a problem to begin with. Just by creating proper division of labor and giving people specific spheres of the organization that they're responsible for, that will create an immediate improvement. Okay, And most likely, That'll bust the stats up right away, but that isn't the solution for a pause stat. The pause stat is assuming we have people who are specialized in their particular zones or areas of the practice. I have a person in charge of the schedule. Maybe I have somebody in charge of finance. Maybe I have an office manager. Maybe I have a, a financial coordinator. It depends on how big my practice is. And you'd want to do this too. Like, let's say you had a situation where there were four hygienists and two doctors. Chances are you're going to have several dental assistants. Well, somebody should be in charge of the dental assistant. Because just think with a basic, without getting into heavy organization theory here, because there's a lot to this. But let's think of something basic for a second. Let's say you had an office manager and there were 14 employees, you know, two doctors, one owner doctor, one associate, and 12 other employees in the office manager. And everybody reported to the office manager. Your office manager would lose their mind. They spend all day talking to the different people in the practice because they wouldn't have time to actually get on to doing their own job. The office manager might have the two or three people at the front desk who report to them, but then there's also a lead hygienist and a lead dental assistant, and the other assistants report to them. Then you have a degree of organization which starts to make things flow and work out a little bit. But then also if I'm trying to debug this pause statistic, let's say that the dental assisting area is completely overloaded. What would be the highest post, as Mr. Hubbard says, in the overloaded area it would be the lead dental assistant, and I would get their lines east. So that's the first thing it assumes. You have divisional labor and you have a hierarchy, people who are in charge, etc. So where it becomes, as Mr. Hubbard says, crippling to the organization, right, is let's say we have that office manager, as I was describing earlier, they're completely slammed. They're effectively now being the treatment coordinator. So not only are they not doing the other things they used to do, they have zero focus on future growth. Everything starts to fall behind and things become stressful. And in a lot of cases, it really depends, okay, on the area of the organization you're looking at. But let's say, for example, let's take something like marketing. Let's say your office manager is handling your marketing. Well, in many cases, marketing isn't going to give you an immediate result. You know, you have to, what you do today, you're going to see the results of four to six weeks from now. Even with internet marketing, it's not, you can get some immediate something, but you're really not going to see the full effect of it for four to six weeks. And then in order to really monitor and manage and control and direct that marketing, I have to stay on top of it. Is it hitting? Uh, what are the metrics like? What's my return on investment? I have to stay on top of this stuff. Well, if you're growing, 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 and your office manager becomes more and more buried into a particular area of the practice, well, then they end up doing the irreducible minimum on some of, the, some of these things, and it doesn't make them a bad person. It makes them an overloaded person, and then you will see your expansion will start to falter and growth will stop, and then you find that you're still spending $1,500 on your marketing spend for Google pay-per-click, but you know your cost per click has gone up, and the number of new patients you were getting is, has gone down, as well as your conversion rate because your office manager no longer has time to listen to calls that the receptionist was picking up. You, you get where this is going. You could also see this with a doctor. Let's say you had a doctor who was rolling along and everything was great. Then you've added that third hygienist 
right? And the new patients have doubled from 30 to 60. Well, now the doctor starts to become more and more overloaded. And a lot of the things that the doc used to do to maybe make sure case acceptance was working out, namely spend enough time with the patient to answer their questions, they don't just have time for anymore. So they're roller skating operatory to operatory. And then you see that despite these higher metrics, you know, they're doing three exams per hour in hygiene some hours, and they're seeing, uh, you know, three, four new patients a day. You're going to see that despite the fact that you've added all these potential production enhancers, that your production has not increased commensurately with where you should have been. You've doubled your new patients, but you haven't doubled your revenue from new patients, you see? And your patients of record aren't accepting treatment like they used to because the doc just just doesn't have time. Their lines have become jammed. Mr. Harvard continues with this. He says this, example, gives an example. One executive and her division, which is an area of an organization, by the way, one executive and her division stacked up and coping frantically. Senior executive wonders what to do. Their statistics are paused in a level line. They are overworked. Hire more clerks? No. Sort out the executive and be sure more help is furnished on that position. Then the executive with a personal secretary to sort her mail, etc., looks up and starts sorting out the division. So this could manifest in a number of ways. Let's say you had a really busy, productive executive. Well, their value uh, is is high. You know, if, if you were to have them leave the practice for three months, you would see the income crash severely. So it's worth spending a couple dollars to do something, maybe hire a secretary, you know, to, to lighten their load a little bit to maybe help them with things that they don't have to do so they could focus on the things that only they have to do. This happened to me early in my career as an executive. I had no problem working. And um, I mean, statistically, I wasn't all that bad. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I was great or whatever. I'm just, it's just not my basic personality. But, you know, statistically, I was doing pretty well and there was a lot of expansion happening. And I remember uh, finally HR hired me an assistant. We, we call it a communicator here, someone who actually maintained my you know, lines of communication and made sure my orders were getting complied with and things like this. I didn't want a communicator. It was literally forced on – well, forced is a strong word, okay? But it was sort of like, uh, hey, Jeff, here's your communicator. She's sitting at this desk. And then I went, okay, well, I'm supposed to have this person do work, so I better figure out what work they're supposed to do. I've had one ever since. This started in you know, 2001. I've had a communicator ever since because without one, I end up focusing on things which I don't really have to do, okay, uh, that someone else could do. And I don't focus on the things that only I can do. This is sort of like with a doctor. You know, you don't want the doctor. If assuming, obviously, what a dental assistant can and cannot do really depends on where you practice. But if an assistant can make temps, then the assistant should be making temps. Uh, there are things an assistant can do. You want them to, to max out everything an assistant can possibly do because if you have the doctor doing it when someone else in theory could do it, you're actually burning time that could be spent doing something more effective to the practice. So in the case of the doctor who slammed and overloaded, you might reorganize their schedule, get another dental assistant. It may come to the point if you've maxed out the doctor's schedule where you need to bring in an associate doctor. But the idea is we need to lighten that load. And when you bring in the associate, the idea is not just to get somebody who replicates what the doctor does. They take maybe some of the the easier to do procedures uh, off the doctor's schedule so that the doctor maybe who's specially trained in you know placing implants or FMR cases or something like this, that specially trained doctor can focus on those things while the associate picks up the single crowns and you know sees the emergencies and the kids and everything else. And Mr. Hubbard illuminates here a little bit further in this next quote. He says, the old trick I used to use was tell an overworked director, draw me up a list of all the hats you are wearing. And let me define hats for you real quick as we use it in the Hubbard management system. A hat, you you could probably think with what it is to a degree, but here's what he says. A hat is the specialized duties someone does as a part of their job position or role. And this term comes from the fact that people such as firemen, policemen, or train conductors often wear special hats to indicate their jobs. So, you know, we, we, we've heard this term sort of bending about from time to time, you know, that we're wearing a lot of hats or, um, you know, that, that he's not really wearing his hats or wearing his hat or something like this. You may have heard that term before or wearing a lot of hats. I know I've heard quite a bit. But uh, what he would do, as he says here, is he says he would – 
Tell an overwork director, draw me up a list of all the hats you are wearing. Now, this is an interesting exercise. I've done this with overwhelmed executives, including dental office managers, and it's pretty illuminating because you'll find a couple things, especially when they have that proper division of labor, like you have the different staff all with on different hats, you know, the schedule coordinator and the financial coordinator and the treatment coordinator and this one and that one. You'll find at times that the office manager is still wearing some of the hats of personnel they already have uh, because either the personnel is ineffective or the office manager hasn't turned over the hat or the office manager hasn't gotten the personnel up to the point where they could actually wear the hat or probably the worst situation, believe it or not, is the personnel could do the hat. You have a treatment coordinator who could close big cases, but the office manager doesn't want them to screw it up. So they hold on to that hat themselves and let them only see the cases under two or three thousand dollars or four thousand dollars. Whereas the treatment coordinator is going, hey, you know, let me see these cases, and the office manager is not letting them take over. Ideally, you'd apprentice that person and get them to the point where they could actually do it so that you could turn it over. And I think and it, it, I don't know if it's, you know, this, this is common to everybody. I have seen this phenomena before, but in, in many cases, the office manager started off with, you know, as one of the first staff members the doctor had or when the office was real small. I've actually seen this a lot with, with the MGE program. You have a doc and office manager coming in, they have, you know, four staff and they train, 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 and they work and they implement and the office expands, expands, expands. And now they have, you know, 22 staff. And uh, the place is going bonkers from a production perspective. It's doing great. But the office manager starts to freak out a little bit as they divest themselves of all of these hats. You know, they have somebody now who handles the schedule. They have somebody who handles the treatment coordinator position. And maybe they have one last point. You know, I don't know. Maybe maybe it is still being part-time treatment coordinator or something, or they still do the big cases. And they're reluctant to turn it over. And I've seen it happen before. I've talked to office managers like this, and I said, why don't you just turn it over to the treatment coordinator? You have one. Well, then what would I do? Well, you're the executive. You're supposed to make sure you built this place. You're the person who's supposed to make sure that it's actually running and keeps it expanding and productive. You know, that means you're, you, you've done a good job. You've expanded. You've built the place up to where it is now. So now get people to do their jobs. Now that, that's your job now and make sure that there are people to do these jobs, okay? And continue working on expansion and making sure that you're helping to achieve the doctor's goals for the business. That's the office manager's job. But it's something you have to be wary of as this happens. You don't want somebody clinging on all claws to an old hat because they're afraid of what they're going to do. If they're an executive, believe me, there's plenty to do. So again, he says, I'll read this again. The old trick I used to use was to tell an overwork director, draw me up a list of all the hats you're wearing. Because he goes on, he says, and he or she would finally bring me one in, this list. Round-eyed, 35 hats, I recall one saying. I would, <laughs> so imagine that for a second, just interjecting. So this is an exercise I've done with office managers. Take a look at all the hats you're wearing, whether they're hats that you have people for or hats that you don't or hidden hats that you didn't even think you were wearing anymore. Make a list of all of them. And you don't even have to be that, that general you know, scheduler. You might be the person who still makes sure that the office is locked and the alarm is on before everybody leaves for the day, even though you're not the last one leaving. You're still office security or you're checking the supply order or something. So you make a list of all these hats. So as Mr. Hubbard says here, he says, uh, he or she would finally bring one in round-eyed. 35 hats, I recall one saying. And he goes on. I would take the one nearest to the director in duties and fill it with a staff member, and the department would ease off. So a pause statistic comes from the jam lines of the topmost executives and is best remedied by easing them. So again, the office manager is being the treatment coordinator four to six hours a day. Time to get a treatment coordinator and get them on the job. You have a scheduler that's completely buried under, you know, the, the expansion in the practice and they can't keep up and things are starting to flag a bit. This is, again, assuming the place was growing and they were doing a good, a good job, maybe hire a hygiene coordinator that works underneath the scheduler. Maybe you need an associate doctor. Maybe the office manager uh, was spending, I don't know, two, three hours a day on new patient marketing and the place was going uh, great. There's tons of new patients coming in, but now they're getting more and more tied up as the office is expanding. You might have to somebody take over that position. I mean, in some cases, I've seen some of these 
jams relieved even by outsourcing. You might have somebody who does insurance ver- verification and filing. Uh, you might even have somebody – I've seen people with implant funnels who use an external uh, – service to actually get those patients on the schedule if the office is too overloaded. There's lots of different ways you can ease the lines. In many cases, as Mr. Hubbard says, again, I would take the one nearest the director and duties and fill it with the staff members. So again, with the office manager or with the doctor or with the scheduler and so on, you get somebody else, they pick up that slack and then things start to flow, right? Because remember, as Mr. Hubbard says, in expansion, the person who never notices is the man in charge and his lines are the most crippling to the organization if jammed. Okay. So what we're trying to do is free up the lines of the people at top so that they can actually come up for air, see what's going on, take charge again, as opposed to being buried under the onslaught of more and more work. And this is how with that forward look again, you can get your expansion going. And the other thing, the last thing I'll mention on this is if you don't do this, the idea of expansion equates to pain. You know, if I'm now, I've built this office up as a manager and I'm working 55 hours a week and I haven't really turned over these hats. I'm still wearing all these different hats. My lines are completely jammed. If I'm talking to the doctor owner about you know doubling the practice, I, I don't like my life right now. I can't even imagine my life if we double, you know? So we need a plan. We need to get somebody to take these hats off my line. Some of the hats that, uh, you know, that I'm still grabbing onto, for example, a treatment coordinator, pick those up take them off my lines and being done, being done, having the job done competently so that I can get forward thinking again. Anyway, this is just some of the stuff we go over with regards to stat management. There's a ton more to it as far as comparing stats, analyzing stats, what to do when your stat does this and that and whatnot. We covered on the MGE Power Program. I'll put a link to it on the episode webpage. And, any, and if you find yourself in this situation where you have this pause statistic and you know, I hope what I went over with you today helps. If you have questions about how you could apply it, maybe you have a very particular situation, uh, feel free to call us. We do a free practice consultation. You can contact us at 800-640-1140. I'll put a link to the practice consultation on the episode webpage as well. And you can find us online at mgeonline.com. Folks, that's all I have for you this week. Um, Have a great week, and we will see you at the next episode.